In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. And for a war of such unimaginable scale, there must exist a weapon of unparalleled fury and power to act as the last line of defense against humanity's doom. A weapon wielded by superhumans and forged in the fires of over 10,000 years of battle, the bolt gun. From its humble beginnings standing out amidst the iconic arms of science fiction to its implementation across both tabletop and video games, this particular weapon has had an undeniable impact on pop culture. So I've come to Warhammer World to talk to the very people that built that legacy and created one of the most iconic weapons in Warhammer 40,000. The bolt gun, also commonly referred to as the bolter, is most well known for being the primary armament of the superhuman heroes of the 41st millennium, the Space Marines. It is a weapon of devastating effect that's brought to bear against the deadliest of mankind's foes, whether it be hulking aliens, warp-touched demons, or the armored heretic Space Marine legions. The bolt gun is a roaring weapon that fires a massive .75 caliber two-stage rocket propelled explosive bolt as standard. The bolts are comprised of a diamantine tip with a mass reactive fuse and contains a depleted deuterium core. Now that's a lot of cool sci-fi made up words, but all that you really need to know is that it can penetrate the thickest armor of enemy opposition and detonate, effectively blowing them up from the inside out. Within the world of Warhammer 40,000, the bolt gun was designed by the god emperor of mankind and manufactured on huge forged planets by the cybernetically enhanced tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus the engineers, technical savants, and keepers of humanity's most technologically advanced hardware. But in the real world, the Holy Bolt Gun had much humbler beginnings. To truly understand the history of the Bolt Gun, however, we need to head to the source. Look at the sketched creations and bizarre designs of Jez Goodwin decades ago, examine the painstaking application of two thin coats by Duncan Rhodes and the Warhammer TV team, and seek out information on the various other people that contributed to the creation of the iconic weapon. Only then can we really get a handle on its impact. The original design of the bolt gun was done by a guy called Bob Naismith in the late 80s when we were just starting out Road Trader, which was our first iteration of Warhammer 40,000. I worked on the first set, uh, but I tended to do things like I was doing the helmets and various other things. The gun had already been made to go on to that, and we worked around the gun. But what we found was that some of the uh, design features on there weren't really conducive to uh, having Marines running around holding them, the magazine was a bit too far forward, so his other hand was behind it when he was holding it. When we first did it, um, Rick, who'd written 40K, was looking at some development that had been going on on gyrojet guns. But the idea was that for a big Marine that you needed a big gun, and having a machine gun didn't really work, so he, what he wanted was this thing that pumped out massive explosive shells, and so he wrote it up accordingly to that. I don't think he was necessarily going, this is what we would be using in 40,000 years time. He just wanted something really brutal. This no doubt helped what saw a new sci-fi franchise stand out against titans like Judge Dredd, Star Wars, and The Terminator, which were all dominating the 80s with their unique takes on futuristic fiction. During the 80s and 90s, science fiction was very much in love with using brightly colored lasers as their weapon of choice. But the industrial futurist form of the bolt gun, a grim dark weapon designed to fight the horrors of deep space, set it aside from the clean, sleek offerings that had become a mainstay in sci-fi. I think it's got a lot to do with the design, even through the different specifications of the bolter, like the heavy bolter or bolt pistols, it's got unique design features that you can trace to each type, and also you can trace back through the history of Warhammer 40,000. So you can look at a Primaris Marine with a bolt rifle and you could trace that back to Rogue Trader. And that's a testament, I think, to the studio's work in making something super recognizable um, that has longevity. It's, um, it's an iconic thing. I don't think it was conscious. I think what happened was that um, we made what we thought would work with our stuff, and certainly we made what would work as a, a small toy soldier. We weren't thinking about a larger version, or we weren't thinking about how it would look in the real world or a film prop. This was all about how it would work on a toy soldier, how it would look on a tabletop. I think the bolter really stands out because it seems to be a, a slightly unnecessarily brutal weapon. It's a really large machine gun that not only shoots things, but then the bullets explode afterwards. So if you need something dead, it will absolutely make something dead. <laughs> the Godwin Patton Bolter is currently the most widely used variant of the weapon and has served the superhuman servants of mankind for many millennia. The bolt gun is built with the inhuman size of the Space Marines in mind, 
with their stature and power armor being able to absorb the recoil that would completely destroy the arm of any average human. But there are more compact models of the Bolter that exist for the use of the unaugmented defenders of the Domain of Humanity, such as the Godwin Diaz pattern bolt gun that is wielded by the Sisters of Battle, the sisterhood of warriors that make up the fighting force of the religious cult of the Imperium. And there's the smaller caliber bolt guns that are bestowed to the unaugmented human forces of mankind's army, be that in the leading hands of an officer of the Astra Militarum or as a tool of discipline in the hands of a commissar. But in the world of Warhammer 40,000, the enemies of mankind are without end. And as such, the armaments of the Space Marines must be able to overcome any and all foes. And while cleaving chainswords, superheated plasma weapons, and claws shrouded in lightning certainly can get the job done, there are few weapons that have the reverence of the Holy Bolter. Beyond the standard pattern of the weapon, there exists a plethora of other bolt weapons. So a Marine with a Bolter may be outnumbered, but never outgunned. They are very much a weapon of their environment, a brutal weapon to perfectly match the brutal way of life in the 41st millennium. So the Bolter, in a way, summarizes the Imperial dogma, and that's the Space Marine way. The Space Marines are devised to be a spear pointer, a thrust to the heart, and the Bolter is the, a perfect weapon to sum that up, really. This is something that can even kill another Space Marine if it's used well. So we're talking about a weapon here that is built for power, for anger, for noise, for thunderous impact, for intimidation. It's really heavy, it's quite temperamental, it's difficult to maintain, but it's worth it. The Imperium considers it worth it for the sheer amount of force this thing can kick out. One of the things I, I, I was always first drawn to with, with Space Marines in particular is a lot of the, the, the most scary sort of races and things like that in sci-fi tend to be um, some sort of alien. With a Space Marine you take off his helmet and he looks human underneath, his face will no doubt be scarred up and uh, bits missing, bionic replacements. Yeah, the holy weapon which he deals death with is, is the bolt gun. In every Space Marine army, you're going to have you know, dozens and dozens of bolt weapons because it's it's how they wage war. You know, they they destroy people, they blow bits off people. <laughs> uh, there's no such thing as a glancing shot with a <laughs> with a bolt weapon. You're going to lose something if you get a direct hit. Space Marines take brutality to a whole new level. Whether it's how they you know take on people in combat or how they uh, shoot you dead at, at range, it's uh, yeah, it's all about the brutality, really. While the Bolter is a common sight at the tabletop, it has also helped bring a sense of power to some of my favorite Warhammer video games. One of the first games it appeared in was 1992's Space Crusade on systems like MS-DOS, Commodore 64, and the ZX Spectrum. Considered to be a faithful conversion of the original board game, it pitted a team of Space Marines against an alien force and tasked them with clearing out a roaming mass of lost spaceships that have been fused together, an entity known as a Space Hulk. The selection of Warhammer 40,000 games would stick to the tactical and strategic formula with Chaos Gate and Rights of War until 2003, when THQ and Kuju Games released a first-person shooter offering in the form of Fire Warrior. This was the first time I remember hearing the roar of a bolter and really being taken aback by how fearsome the weapon sounded, especially when I saw the Raptors chapter mowing down the tower in the opening scene of Fire Warrior. I also had no idea that the game featured the voice talent of Brian Blessed, Peter Serafenowitz, and Sean Pertwee until I went back and played it for this very video. A year later, we would see the reveal of what is possibly the most popular Warhammer 40,000 video game series with a trailer that still gives me goosebumps to this day. Dawn of War would grace our PCs in 2004, but what was interesting about the series was that across the three games and the handful of expansions, each title felt different from the last. While the original Dawn of War was a true and true RTS title that utilized squads of Bolter R Marines as the default military unit, barking shots from cover, Dawn of War 2 instead focused on the small squad combat and skirmishes of the Space Marines, allowing you to alter the war gear of the units, finding different patterns of the bolt gun, or even legendary relic bolters to alter your loadout through the game. Dawn of War 3, however, was a blend of both that built on the heroic arms and abilities of its characters while bringing back much of the base building elements that were popular from the first title. Personally, Dawn of War 2 is my favorite of the series, as it was a game that really made Space Marines feel like Space Marines. All of the stories I had read in novels and codexes always described the might of a Space Marine and the bark of a bolt gun. But Dawn of War 2 was a game where I felt like the developers had finally portrayed a Marine and his weapon in the light it deserves. And two years later, Relic would take that feeling and dial it up to 11 with what is my favorite game in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. In 2011, Relic released Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine, which has what I believe to be the best virtual representation of a Space Marine. 
It put you in control of an incredibly strong, durable marine, and you just felt like a killing machine. The characters were how I imagined space marines to act. They looked exactly how they were supposed to. Worry not, Captain. I've saved some orcs for you. But most importantly, they absolutely nailed the bolt gun. It was a weapon that would find use in nearly every encounter. Whether you were dispatching orcs or chaos, it always felt like the perfect weapon for the job. And it was oh so satisfying when you watched your enemies burst apart after a bolter hit. In my mind, Space Ring was the first game to really nail the roar of the bolter. While it's hard to imagine what sound such a larger than life weapon would make when you're reading the novels or playing the tabletop, as soon as I started putting the trigger on my Xbox 360 controller, I knew this was the best the Bolter had ever been. From its muzzle flash, to the damage inflicted, to the hiss and roar of a round flying towards a green skin, this is the game I continue to hold all other video game Bolters against. 2017's Deathwing would see players return to the foul Xenos infested space hulks with a Storm Bolter and Assault Cannon in hand. The co-op fantasy shooter offered an experience similar to that of Left 4 Dead or the Warhammer fantasy entry Vermintide. It was a title that pitted you against seemingly overwhelming odds with an arsenal of customizable equipment. Personally, this is what makes me feel like a space marine in one of these games. I want to feel those overwhelming odds against success, but also that I have the superior firepower and strength to overcome them. I want to feel like the thundering bolt gun in my hands is capable of dropping aliens, demons, and armored behemoths alike. Feeling powerful is something that many games don't always get right, but games like Deathwing and Space Marine absolutely nail it for me. The one I like personally the most, I think, is the one that was in the Fire Warrior video game a number of years ago. When you finally picked the weapon up, it was almost like you took it from an end-of-level boss, so it had a sort of mystique about it. Then when you tried shooting it, you could actually see the rounds like pop out the gun and then ignite and shoot like rockets. It was almost like a reward at that point because you got a load of Imperial Guardsmen running up to you and hey, <laughs> if you fired the secondary mode, they would just get blasted to pieces. It was just <laughs> and it, it, was, it was horrifically violent, of course, but that's exactly what they do. They're, they're really, really disgustingly powerful weapons and they're, they're all about uh, representing the brute force of how the Imperium fights. With a weapon that has the sheer power and reputation of the bolt gun, it also has an interesting problem when it comes to the implementation on both the tabletop and in video games. It's important for a gaming experience to be balanced, but the bolt gun's immense power presents a unique problem for developers working on both video games and the real-world tabletop game. On the one hand, you want to create a tense and immersive game that truly captures the essence of the Space Marine experience. But on the other, you don't want to cheapen that experience by leaning too heavily on the overpowered renown and infamy of a space marine and his bolt gun. While many novels and short stories do great work when it comes to creating the exploits of a marine and their go-to armament, what makes for an interesting story may not always make for a tense and engaging gaming experience. I've seen some of the bolters in video games. Uh, they vary a huge amount. Some of them have way too high a rate of fire. Uh, one of, some of them have way too slow a rate of fire. But it's, it's, it, it is what it is. It was a, a gun that was actually designed for a toy soldier. It has to take some kind of uh, modification when you put it through other types of media. While Warhammer 40,000's bolt gun may not have the same renown or fame as some science fiction franchises can boast, it is certainly one of the most unique and enduring firearms in the genre. It's something that's very distinctive to the franchise, but it's also a weapon that newcomers to 40k can appreciate and latch onto. It was a weapon that opted to keep the bang in science fiction rather than add to the orchestra of pew pew. And it's a fictional firearm that perfectly complements the very real grimdark genre that Warhammer 40,000 helped champion. In fact, grimdark is a term that is derived from the very tagline of Warhammer 40,000. The Bolter says so much about the world in which it exists. It's a brutal weapon for a brutal universe wielded by only the most ferocious. It's a galaxy inhabited by warring alien races, pestilent demon gods, and the most foul of mutants. If you see or hear about the Bolter, your mind starts to dance with the thoughts of what exactly a weapon of such fury would be needed for. What could be so awful that a portable rocket launcher with piercing exploding heads wielded by superhumans is what's required to kill it? It's not clean, it's not shiny, and it's not subtle, but nor should it be. In fact, I think this is one of the reasons why it stood out in science fiction. The brutality of the universe is reflected in the brutality of its armaments. I think the Bolter says um, something quite interesting about Warhammer 40,000 because although it does have laser weapons, plasma weapons, like quite sort of high concept sci 
fire weapons. The Bolter feels more medieval because it's very physical and very substantial and that to me conveys one of the core aspects of Warhammer 40,000 which is that kind of quasi-fantasy aesthetic so it's it's a key part of that. It feels like a representation of what the Imperium is like they are beset on all sides they face threats every day um, it's a very dire kind of situation to be in and I think that breeds a weapon like that so the Bolter is almost emblematic of the Imperium's response to being besieged constantly. It's very much a weapon that comes from the situation that they exist in. The Space Marines is something that's just become iconic and it's so iconic that we can actually change the size, shape and a lot of those things and people still know what it is. It's supposedly a sophisticated weapon, incredibly brutal um, and you can decorate it with gothic stuff. So you've got three elements there of pretty much what the Imperium is about. Warhammer 40k is probably my favourite science fiction franchise, so coming here and learning more of the story and impact of the Bolter has been a truly amazing experience. It is an object that I feel so familiar with, from the hundreds of miniature versions I've painted since I was a teen, to the video game adaptations I've wielded via a keyboard and mouse. And yet, through the course of making this video, I've learned so much about the bolt gun. And after countless years, the sight of one still triggers nostalgic memories of the smell of metal paint. If you've never tried the painting for yourself, I honestly can't recommend it enough. While the Warhammer 40,000 universe is pretty grimdark, I've honestly found painting to be a calming and wholesome force for me. So if it's something you're curious about, you can head to the Games Workshop site or your local hobby shop to pick up a set for yourself. And I would like to extend a thanks to the Games Workshop team for helping make this feature happen. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Loader. If you enjoyed it, make sure you like the video, subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments section down below. And if you've missed the previous episodes, make sure to go back and check those out as well.